Dear students, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the 10th program on Software Engineering 1 course. In the previous program, we explained that system modeling is an important activity of the analysis phase. A software engineer prepared a number of different models to better understand the system and its requirements. We discussed the data modeling activity which focuses on identifying data objects and relationship between them is very important. We discussed that data modeling is done independently without focusing on the processing that will be done on the data. But a software is not just a collection of data. Some processing is to be done on the data to produce the required information. Also, system must respond to the external and internal events. Therefore, one needs to examine what type of processing the software needs to perform and how it will respond to various events. Dear student, today we will be discussing process or function modeling in more detail. We will explain process modeling and DFDs. But before we start discussing the process modeling and DFD, we want you to remind of some of the models that are developed in the analysis phase of software development process. Let us look again at this diagram. There are three basic models which are prepared in the analysis phase. The entity relationship diagrams or the data modeling, data flow diagrams, and the state transition diagrams. These are three different tools which are used to model three different things of a software. We have already discussed the, how the entity relationship diagrams are used to model the data of a system. Today, we'll be discussing the data flow diagrams and how data flow diagrams are used to model the process which is performed by the software. Dear students, every computer system is an information transformer. A computer-based system accepts inputs and does some processing on the input and produces the required output. The system accepts input in a variety of forms. Then it applies hardware, software, and human elements to transform it and produce the output in a variety of forms. The input may be a series of numbers or a string typed by the human operator, or it may be read from a secondary storage device, or even it may be a control signal coming from a device or data coming from a network. As the input moves through the software, it is modified by a series of transformation. A transform or processing may be a simple logical operation performed on the data, or it may be a complex series of operations performed on the input data. The output can be a single number or a 200-page long report. The, the output may even be in, no, in non-numeric and non-textual form. For example, it may be in the form of a sound or it might be a control signal sent to a device. Therefore, a software system should accept the input in a variety of forms, does the required processing on the input and produce the output in the required form, which may not always be numbers, digits and the characters. Dear students, a software engineer must develop the understanding of what type of inputs are given to the system, what types of processing is performed by the software, and what type of output is to be produced. In structure analysis and design methodology, special kind of diagrams are used for capturing input, processing, and output of a system. These diagrams are generally known as data flow diagrams. Formally, a data flow diagram 
or a DFD is a graphical technique that represents information flow and the transforms that are applied as data moves from input to output. Data flow diagrams may be used to represent a system or a software at any level of abstraction as we'll see in the coming example. A number of different notations are used in DFDs to present the processing, the data store, and the external entities. The most commonly used notations are shown here. A circle is used for a process. An external entity is shown by a rectangle. An open-ended rectangle represents a data store, and an arrow is used to show the data flow. DFD is such a powerful technique that it uses only four basic symbols to show all the input, output, and processing requirement of a system. It's a very simple and easy tool to show how the system receives the data, what, in, what type of processing is performed, and how the output is really produced. Dear students, let's construct a DFD step by step as we go along the example, we'll be explaining the procedure that is used to construct crack DFV. We'll also mention other related points while discussing the example. So let's start with the example. Once you start constructing a DFD, the first step is, of course, you should review the ER diagram you have already produced to isolate data objects and then do a grammatical parse to determine the operations. You should also determine external entities, and external entities are the producer or the consumer of data. An external entity can be a person, an operator, it can be another system, it can be another department. Anything which gives the data or receives the information from the system is called the entities or the external entities of the system. So you should be very carefully determining that what are the external entities of the system and what inputs they provide and what type of output they receive from the system. This also gives you the boundary of the system. So you should be focusing purely on the system which it needs to be developed and not on the elements which are outside the system which just use the system for giving the information to the system or receiving the information from the system. Once you have done the first two steps, now you are ready to construct what we call the context level DFD. Dear students, to explain how a DFD is developed, let's go through a simple example. In our example, we have an XYZ, which is a small fast food restaurant and interested in automating their food ordering system. The present system works like this. A customer places an order at the counter and makes the payment. The person at the counter gives a receipt to the customer and passes his order to the kitchen. At the same time, the inventory and goods sold files are updated to reflect the current sale. At the end of the day, a consolidated report on the goods sold and inventory is produced for the management. This is a very brief description of a system. You should also prepare a description of the system you want to automate. Of course, the description you will be writing will not be that much brief. You have to put all possible information into your description so that it can give you 
how the system really works in complete detail. Once we have that description of the system, the next step is we should now isolate the external entities. External entities, as we defined before, are those entities which provide the input to the system or they receive the information from our system. When we read the description of our system, we see the external entities in our system are the customer, because customer gives the information to the system. The information which is provided by the customer is of course the order he places to the system. Now the person at the counter gives a receipt to the customer and passes his order to the kitchen. That means the order which is given by the customer is passed on to the kitchen. So kitchen receives the information from our system. Now the person which issues the receipt to the customer, of course, should not be treated, treated as an external entity. He is part of the system, so he should not be taken as an external entity. As we read the description, we see that inventory and goods sold files are updated to reflect the sale. So there is no external entity there. At the end of the day, a consolidated report on goods sold and inventory is produced for the management. That means management is another external entity which receives some information from our system. So we have identified the external entities of our system. Now once we have identified the external entities, the next step is now we should identify what type of data is produced or given by those external entities to our system and what information is received by the external entities. To do that, let's go through again with the description of our system and try to identify the data flow which goes from external entity to the system and from system to the external entities. Now in the description, we have identified the data flow which is which is in the system. First, a customer places an order. Of course, an order is information which comes from the customer and goes to our system we want to build. Receipt is another information which is coming out of our system and is going to the customer. What's more important to recognize here that in the description we might have written the physical thing, for example, a receipt, which is a piece of paper. But when we are doing the data flow diagram, it's not the physical thing which are important. We are interested in the information which is written on that physical thing. For example, a receipt might have the detail of the order given by the customer. It might have the prices of different items and a total of it. So that information is more important for us. Then the same information, the order information, is also passed on to the kitchen so that the kitchen can prepare the order. So order detail also goes to the kitchen external entity. Another information which can be identified is the consolidated report, which is produced by our system and given to the external entity management we have already identified. Now once we identified the external entities and the information flow, now we should build what we call the context level diagram. And the context level diagram, we only show one process in the middle which contains the name of the system and we show the external entities and the data which is going to the system or coming out of the system going to the external entities. For our example, now this is a single process. We give it a number zero. Name of the process is food ordering system, basically the, which is also the name of our system. The three external ent entities as we already ent identified, the customer, kitchen, and the manager. Now, what information is 
coming from the customer to the system is the customer order. And the system produces a receipt or it prints a receipt which is given back to the customer. Food order given by the customer also passed on to the kitchen, which is another external entity. Our system also produces the management report, the information that goes to the external entity restaurant manager. Now one thing is very important to note here, that each data flow must be properly labeled. Just putting the arrows is not enough. We must write what information is coming from each external entity going to the system or coming out of the system going to the external entity. So each arrow and every entity must be properly named. In the context level diagram, the process we have in the middle is given the number zero. Now once we have prepared the context le level diagram, which sets basically the boundaries of the system, we should keep developing the DFDs in the next levels. Now to develop the, or to refine our context level diagram and to put more details that how the system really works and what information is really passed on the system and how it is processed, we create a number of sub-level DFDs, or the, we call the child DFDs. How to create the child DFDs? You have to go back to the description of the system and try to find out the major processing or the major activities that are performed by the system. You should write a narrative describing the transforms, that what type of processing is taking place there. Then you parse the text or the description of the system to determine next level transform. Basically, you should be looking for the subsystems or the major processes. One of the common mistake which is made while creating the DFB is that we explore the bubble. From the context level diagram, we directly go to a very detailed level of DFDs. That's not the right way of constructing the DFDs. Once we are constructing the DFD, we should be exploding the bubbles very slowly, adding more detail at each level. Once you have created the context level DFD, if the system is a big one, then you should be looking for the subsystems which make the whole system. And each subsystem can become a process itself at the next level. In our example, which is a small example, we can identify the major activities which are performed by the system. And each major activity itself becomes a process in the next level, DFD. Then, once you are creating the next level DFDs, you should balance the flow to maintain data flow continuity. That means, once you create a child diagram, then the child diagram should accept all the inputs which the parent diagram is accepting, or the parent process is accepting. No more, no less. And the child processes, or the child diagram must produce all that output that is produced by the parent process. Once you have identified the major activities of the system, now you are ready to draw the level zero DFD. When you draw a level zero DFD, make sure that you do not explore a bubble. That means do not introduce too many of sub-processes. And generally, each process should be divided from one to five uh, sub-processes. Of course, this is not very strict uh, limitation, but it's good to not to explore a bubble into too many sub-processes. Now let's see how we uh, create a level zero DFD. Here is our context level DFD showing the external entities and the one process, then we take that process and identify the major activities of that process are major sub-processes. 
and then this one process has been broken into five different sub-processes. But these sub-processes must accomplish the same function as the parent process does. Second, you can see from this diagram, the still the input to the process is the same one. We cannot change that input. The child processes must accept the input which the parent process is accepting. And it should produce the same output which the parent process is producing. You cannot introduce a new input to a child diagram and a child diagram or a child process cannot produce any extra output. So that's the basic procedure of going from the context level diagram to the next level diagram. For our system, let's see the level one DFT. Now from the description of the system, we have identified four major activities performed by the system. The system receives and transforms customer food order. It updates the goods sold file. It also updates inventory file and it generates the management report. Now, note one more thing here. At the level zero DFT, we have also introduced the data store, which are used to store the data permanently. It might be a database. You must not show any data store at the context level diagram. Note another thing that level zero DFT is still balanced. That means it still receives all the inputs which we have shown at the context level diagram and it also produces the same output. The level zero diagram now gives us more detail about the system. So that's the basic idea of making the DFTs. We should explore each process or explore each bubble slowly putting little more detail so that we can understand the system in much better way. Now still the processes which are shown in this diagram, they still need more information. We need to explain that how the system receives and transforms the customer food order, how the update is really done, and how the system generates the management report. So we need to put more detail into the DFTs. And we have to further divide this each process into its sub-processes. And each sub-level diagram or the next level diagram will be showing more detail about a process. That is, each process on a DFD, at any level of DFD, may in turn be exploded to create more detailed child diagrams. The process on a DFD that is exploded is called the parent process. The primary rule for creating child diagram is the vertical balancing which dictates that a child diagram cannot produce output or receive input that the parent process does not produce or receive. So that's we already explained, that the child process should not accept any new inputs and it should not provide any extra output. Now let's see the level zero DFT for our example again. So we have these four processes. Now let's create a child diagram for our process one and see that this process one can be, can be described in more detail in the level one diagram. So that one process, process one, has been broken down into five smaller processes. Now look at the numbering convention. 1.1 1 .1 shows this is the process one or the child process one of the process one. 1.2, 1 1.3, so all these are the 
sub-processes of process number one, which we have already shown on the level zero diagram. So we have now the process received customer order. Then the customer order goes to another process which transforms the order to a format which is suitable for the kitchen and now the information goes to the kitchen. Another process is generate customer receipt and generate goods sold increments. So all, the, all these five processes basically do the exactly the same thing as process number one we have shown you know, on the level zero diagram. Now also note that still we have done the balancing. Our system still receives the same input and produces the same output. Of course, at that level, we don't need to show any external entities. But if there are some internal data stores which are used only by process one, then they should be also shown on that diagram. Now once we have created level one DFD for our process one, we can also create the similar diagrams for other processes. Now question is, which processes need to be expanded? A very simple principle. If the, if the process shown on a diagram is a simple one and can be written in a very simple description, in a very simple algorithm, then of course there is no need of breaking that process into the sub-processes. But if a process still is a complex process and can be broken down into the smaller sub-processes, then we should be creating a child diagram for that process. In our example, we also create a child diagram for process four, which is generate management report. So once we explore the process number four, that's what we get. This is the level one diagram for process number four, which access goods sold and inventory data because we want to produce the management report how the management report is produced. These are the three processes which combine together produce that report. One process is that we should read the data from the inventory file and from the daily goods sold file. That data is given to another process that does the aggregation of the inventory data and the goods sold data. And the aggregated data is passed on to the next process which prepares the management report. And now the management report is, is produced and which goes to the external entity, the restaurant manager. We can continue with exploding the bubbles if we need to. For example, if we look at process 4.1, which says excess goods sold and inventory data, if you think that accessing that information from a file still is a complicated process and needs to be discussed in more detail, then you should be creating a child diagram for process 4.1. And the similar approach should be used for other processes. Now let's see if we, uh, if we explore our 4.3, which is prepare management report, then we get a level two diagram for that process how the report is produced. We get the aggregate data. One process formats the data in the required format. The formatted data is passed on to another process which basically prints the, prints the report and the report is given to the management. Now we have to apply the same principle again. If the formatting of the data, the formatting of the management report is a complicated process, then we should be creating a child process for this process as well. But if this process can be described in a simple term, in a simple algorithm, then of course there is no need of going any further. Now this should be used for each and every process. Each process at any level 
of DFD, which you think has to be, which you think has to be exploded. It's a complicated process, and the, its sub-processes can easily be identified. Then we should be creating a child diagram for that process. Once we have a process which is very simple, of course there is no need of creating a child process for that one. Dear students, in today's program, we explain what is process modeling, and with the help of one example, we explain how a DFD can be constructed. We'll be continuing with the system modeling, and we'll discuss how the behavior model is produced during the analysis phase. Till then, a lot of